We read this morning from 1 Samuel. This is chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, well, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they came, Samuel looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. Samuel said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and Samuel said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? Jesse said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Jesse went and brought David in. Now David was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. And speak to God. This congregation, you have elected a pastor nominating committee and charged them with the task of discerning God's will for who will be the next installed pastor of the church. With your help, with the congregation's input and preferences, um, the PNC is commencing on writing the church's online profile. Once approved and posted, it will be matched with the profiles of pastors, candidates who are seeking a call at another church. It is, if it sounds like it, it is roughly the equivalent of online dating. <laughs> and you know, when it comes to online dating, that you want to present yourself in a favorable light, but you also have to be honest in what it is that you are selling. If you're not six feet tall with six-pack abs, don't put that on the church's profile. And likewise, you need to be honest about what it is that you are going out to buy. If what you are looking for is a mid-sized sedan, then don't go looking to buy one of those foreign sports cars with all the extra gears. You want the relationship to be a good match. You want it to stick and be enduring. Now, once those profiles are out there and the computer has done its machinations and been matching and spitting out the matches for it, then the, the heart work begins. It's hard with a D, but it's also heart work in here. That's when the PNC will be prayerfully considering the pastor profiles, looking, <coughs> gleaning 
from them, being attentive to the details in them, that will give them a clue as to whether or not this is God's choice for Westminster. That's not an easy job to ask them to do that, which is why we all need to be praying for them and encouraging them and supporting them in all many ways. Now, the text that we take up for today about the prophet Samuel is, is, is a discernment of God's will in the selection of Saul's successor as king in Israel. Samuel is a one-man PMC appointed by God for that task. And he has been dispatched to Bethlehem to choose from among Jesse's many sons. Samuel thought this was going to be an easy task for him to do. And he quickly discovers that it was far more challenging than he expected. Samuel was using human metrics. Physical appearance and stature, the kind of traditional qualities that we as human beings look for in other people for leadership. Taller, older, richer, braver, smarter, more educated, more experienced. Those are the kinds of things that, that we look for. And those things actually do correlate in our culture today. You can Google it. You can go on and say, is height associated with success? Indeed, it is. You will discover that all but five of our U.S. presidents were well above the average for height. You will also find that there's more likely that the average height of people who serve on corporate boards or who are successful in finance and industry across the board people. God doesn't use human metrics, though. God doesn't use human metrics, the thing that we use to make God's hiring decisions. God sees us differently. God looks beyond the surface to see what's really inside of us, what we are made of. And our text tells us that God takes a measure of our hearts. In God's eyes, as God sees us, what's in here matters more. So we read in verse 1, The Lord said to Samuel, I have rejected Saul from being king over Israel. Get packing, fill your horn with oil, and set out. I will send you to Jesse in Bethlehem, for I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. Now if you recall, the people, the Israelites, had demanded a king to rule over them, just like the other nations. And God said, okay, isn't going to end well, but okay. And God picked the king. God picked Saul. And then God unpicked Saul. And then God said, I'm going to pick another person after Saul. And spoiler alert, we know that God selected David to be king over Israel, the shepherd boy who would be the shepherd over the Israelites. Now, we know that David had a keen mind, and he was a fearless fighter. He was a slingshot, as Philip is. And he enjoyed quite a bit of success as king. But it wasn't his political savvy, it wasn't his military skill that gave him that long career as a king. David never usurped the crown, and he didn't keep it by force. Our text today reminds us that the kingship came to David as a gift from God, and David served as king because of God having found favor with David. Verse 5, Samuel sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to a sacrifice. Samuel arrives in Bethlehem. Samuel hosts this sacrifice, which was essentially a cover story that uh, allowed them to surreptitiously anoint David as king while Saul is still on the throne. 
that, as you can imagine, would have gone unfavorably with Saul. That treason and Samuel and everybody else involved would have had negative consequences as a result. Jesse presents seven of his sons, only seven of them, for consideration. The text is silent on whether or not Jesse thought, well, David's too young, or maybe they just were short-handed that day and needed to leave David out in the field with the sheep. We don't know, but we do know that David was initially invited in to interview for the job. Verse 6, when they came, Samuel looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. We get this sense of this progression of the sons being brought forward and Samuel assessing and, and um, discerning God's will. It's kind of like an ancient Near Eastern Cinderella story. The glass slipper is being passed from sibling to sibling, this time in the case of sons. And the first one up is Eliab. Tall and handsome, the stature of the king, Samuel thought, well, this is going to be a shoe-in. But he was warranted in that assessment because why? Samuel had previously gone out to discern God's will and got Saul, who was a head taller than any other of the Israelites. And here again comes the tall and handsome and certainly appropriate oldest son of Jesse, Eliab. God says, no. Verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And the text here is also silent on what exactly it was that Eliab Sinadab and Shammah and all the others were lacking. Don't we know what they didn't have? Nor does it tell us what it was about David and what was in David's heart to have a heart after God that is to give us any kind of guidance as to what this means for us. There's no list of divine qualifications against which we can judge or measure. The scripture is quoted quite a bit for God looks on the heart, but doesn't really actually tell us what it is that God sees in us. Maybe that's the point. Maybe, maybe that's the point of this. Maybe, maybe with God, the lesson is that we are to expect the unexpected. Verse 10, seven sons passed before Samuel, and the Lord had not chosen any of these. Samuel is certainly surprised. Jesse's confused. He thought he had this figured out. I'm not sure that the brothers themselves were disappointed that they were not being selected as king. Verse 11, Samuel asks, are these all of your sons? Jesse tells him that there is the youngest out in the field, David. And Samuel says, well, bring him here. We're not going to sit down for this feast until he comes. No one was expecting David. Not the prophet sent to look for him. Not the people who knew him best, his own family. And yet the Lord said of David, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Expect the unexpected. One day, centuries after David was anointed king, others would be called to Bethlehem called to recognize the Messiah in a little helpless baby lying in a manger, not what they were expecting. Later, drawn to Jerusalem to see a king in a humble carpenter's son hanging from a cross, not what they were expecting. Even today, 
We are called to recognize God's unexpected presence in a baby born in a manger. Called to believe that he suffered in our place and for our sake at the cross. And we're looking back from this side of life. We know what the story is. And it still surprises us. Expect the unexpected. And yet God is often where we don't expect God to be. Story after story of people who weren't expecting what God did or said or what God saw in people. Separating sheep and goats. And people say, what did you see? He says, I saw that in the least of these. When you helped and cared for the least of these, God saw them and we miss out. And so maybe the lesson is to expect the unexpected to be willing to let God surprise us with God's presence in our lives and in the people in our lives. And that brings us back to today, brings us back to what the church is being called to do over the next months and, and longer, to prepare to search for God's choice in a pastor. Not that we're expecting the new pastor to be the Messiah. That job's been filled. Hiring instead a human leader with all their flaws and imperfections, just like David with all of his many flaws and imperfections. Someone who that may not look or sound or act like we're expecting or want. Your inner pastor looks and sounds and acts different than your previous pastor. I'm not six feet tall. And your next pastor is going to look and sound and act different than any of the pastors who have come before. And that's okay. As we grow spiritually and maturely and learn about who we are and what God sees in us and calls us to be and do, allow yourself, allow ourselves, let us allow ourselves the possibility that when the time comes, that we will be surprised when God says, this is the one. Days and months before that, be prayerfully waiting, trusting that God will surely lead us to the next leader of this church.